Hi, welcome to Inside Church. We're so glad that you are able to join us. We trust that as you watch the message that your heart will be stirred and that faith will be built. It's taking us into the presence of God. Amen. So wonderful. So wonderful. So tonight we're going to try and get out the word we didn't get out last week. Amen. Because the word's new every morning. You're not sure of that? Did you say you're not sure? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go with me, if you will, to the Bible in Hebrews 10, verse 35 to 39. Now, can I just ask if there are any visitors were you banished to the back there, Kalen? Is that you sitting there? Good Lord, okay. There's a seat on the front here. You're just hiding there by yourself. Okay. <laughs> uh, glory to God. Are there any visitors here tonight for the first time? Brand new visitors. Praise God. Welcome. Give me a big hand. Where else? Where? Somebody's going like this. Who? Where? One, two, three. Oh, glory to God. Welcome with us. And we're at the back? You don't be shy. It's fine. We just want to love on you. We promise not to hug you if you're nervous. <laughs> glory to God. Welcome. Welcome, you guys. Hey? Come on. Praise God. Praise God. That's awesome. That's awesome. You ready for the word? Amen. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, I stand in amazement what God does. Don't you get amazed by God? Hey? Don't you get amazed when you stop and you think and you see what he does and he doesn't even ask anybody's permission because the earth and the fullness belongs to him. Amen. He doesn't ask permission to come into a city. If you welcome him, he'll come. If you welcome him, he'll come. Amen. So we welcome him here tonight. Let's go to the Word. I'll just commit it to the Lord. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus for your Word tonight. We thank you that we have ears to hear. Thank you that your Word is anointed. Your Word is anointed. It's anointed to destroy every yoke of bondage. Unrenewed minds, thought processes that we may have, that are inconsistent with the truth of your word. I thank you tonight once again, Lord, that as we sit under the anointing of your word, our minds are renewed. Thank you, Lord. Our minds are renewed so that we can prove by your word what is your good and acceptable and perfect will for our lives. Thank you for this, that you have placed a responsibility within us to walk in the truth, to apply the truth, and to enjoy the results of the truth of your word and the fruitfulness with which it enhances the quality of our life. So we give you glory tonight for this again. We thank you for inside Charleston. We thank you for the family there, Lord, that you're busy building in the name of Jesus. Do you agree with that tonight? Say amen. Amen, 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 amen. We might have to ask the Lord to stop the sun so we can reverse the time so we can align their time with our time because they're going to change times now and they're going to go into six hours 
different. It, currently, they're seven, um, which makes it then a bit challenging. At the moment, we bang online, six o'clock, they start 11 o'clock their time. Um, but we're working on it. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. So let's read the word now. And we're going to read Hebrews 10, verse 35 to 39. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which is great reward. Let's read that again. It's so good it deserves repeat. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. See that? For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. It seems that many people lose their vision between stepping out at that point after you have done the will of God and receiving the fullness of the promise. While they are on the water waiting for the full manifestation of the promise, that's when so many people lose heart. And that's why the Bible says through faith and patience we inherit the promise. For yet a little while, verse 37, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Verse 38, now the just shall live by faith. The only reason we would draw back into perdition is because we lay down our faith. There's no other reason. Now, the just live by faith. What's the Bible telling us? It's not something we do periodically. It's something we do every day, every second. Just like if we don't breathe, we die. If we don't have faith in God, we die. Not a physical, but a spiritual death. Now, the just shall live by faith. Of course, ultimately, there's the second death, which is total separation from God. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Well, if we had to look at the other side of that passage of Scripture, my soul has no pleasure in him. In other words... If I move forward in God and I don't draw back, then he has pleasure. Do you ever feel like the Lord's having pleasure out of you? Come on. This is not religion, family. This is the Bible. The Lord has pleasure in us. The Lord has pleasure in us. But he can't have pleasure when we draw back. Why? Because faith is what pleases him. So I can't do what he wants to rejoice in. His son paid a massive price going to the cross. And the reason he did it and planned it that way was to sock the enemy once and for all in the eye. And the only way you can do that is by faith. Because you don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Hello? Hello? But we, do, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but those who believe to the saving of the soul. Let's read that two more times. Because it's that important. But we say, but I, say this with me, but I am not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those I believe to the saving of my soul. 
That's a declaration of faith I got you to make. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. In other words, the fulfillment of God's promise. And so we can make and often do make use of the term vision because the Bible does. But a promise of healing can be vision. It can be vision. I want to have a vision of walking in divine health. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen. Amen. So we live in a, in a world where truth is increasingly viewed as the enemy. You're not hearing me in society. You've just come out of COVID. If you said anything that was contrary to the world's statement, they wanted to arrest you. And in many countries, they did. And now what happens with the truth that's coming out? Where are those people? The Afrikaner says they kus and they kier. That's what they're doing. Come on. Come on. What did we see? Truth. We were told as churches stop getting the people's hope up about being healed. They arrested a pastor in Canada. Remember him? He went to jail for preaching the gospel of truth. And they turned out to be all the liars. Hello? We're not denying it was there. We're saying the same Jesus that heals of whatever heals of that thing. Amen. So that's what happens. We live in a world where truth and society come against us. You need to just accept that. Why? Because they want to silence the voice of truth. Because truth is a person. Truth is Jesus. They want to silence that truth that every man is born a sinner. They don't want you to talk about that. They don't want you to talk about the blood. Do you know how many churches have discontinued preaching about the blood? Because it's offensive to the devil, not to us. It's the power of God. Amen. Because the life of any human being is in the blood. You can't live without blood. So the more morally bankrupt the world becomes or society becomes, the greater the onslaught against truth. And so what happens when that onslaught comes, then people draw back. Or well, maybe don't say that. That's the process of watering down the gospel. That's what the devil wants. Religion can't get people born again. Only the truth of the risen Christ can do that. And so he has the danger of drawing back into perdition. What starts to happen is we start ruining and losing our spiritual liberty until you don't even speak the name of Jesus any longer. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is confronting if you think it does anything else 
you are sincerely wrong. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ confronts lies, confusion, all those things. That's what it does. So, if we draw back and we lose our spiritual liberty, what happens? Well, then sickness can run amok. Can do what it likes. Depression comes, visits regularly. Disillusionment comes all the time. Condemnation, how about that baby who spends its life causing trouble? And so what happens, it will affect the physical and the eternal dimension. And that's what's so important. You see, we never know when Jesus is coming. But beside anything else, if you had to take perdition, it would be the same as the five virgins who never filled their lamps with oil. And then when the Son of Man, the bridegroom, a type of Jesus, was knocking on the door, it was too late. So I always encourage people, stay with your heart full of the healing anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. In, have your mind renewed to believe God, not when you're sick, before you get sick. So when the symptom comes, you kick it into touch. Come on, family. It's no good waiting till you're 60 to have a retirement plan. It's too late. Unless you have a windfall, but that's not coming. That old ship, he passes Durban all the time. Don't wait for your ship to come in like that. Bad plan. Bad plan. You captain your own ship and bring your wealth to yourself. Somebody needs to hear that. So, I want you to see here. So, it's really very easy, isn't it? That we have a right to freedom. See, so if you hear my heart, I'll submit to the government, but not in contradiction to the word. I'll submit to authority, but not in contradiction to the Word of God. And because I know that government is mere flesh and blood, I go for the principalities and the powers, because that's who's really behind this whole thing, whatever it might be. If you look back on the days of revival in different places, you will see that once revival came in the hearts of people, they stopped crying. Come on, family. You think the love of God can't save a criminal? You're very wrong. There's no limit in this. And so if the devil can keep you silent and cause you to draw back because you don't want to be offensive, if you're telling the truth in love, you're going to offend people anyway. You're not trying to do it deliberately. But the seed of that word will take root and it will set them free. It's not yours and my time to work out how long will it take. The important part for us is to be standing, to be standing, to be standing, to be standing. You with me? Praise the Lord. We're going home now, now. Sounds like they all want to go to bed. Oh, no. Word-based faith can only operate in an environment of truth. Please hear me. Making faith statements 
that are not aligned to the word is a bunch of garbage. Don't do that. Some of the stuff that people hang on faith is, doesn't even look like faith, doesn't smell like faith, doesn't even remotely look like faith. So I want you to hear that because it's very important. Faith needs fuel, the Word of God. That's its fuel. The fact that we might know things and work out of that, we better know that it's faith that's working, proper faith. And so what, what I want to encourage you on today, do you think that the enemy won't try and say, You've stretched too far now. Talking about Charleston. You think he doesn't try that? I don't listen to him because he's crazy. Why would I believe a liar? You see, if you know in the word that the Father said, I mean, sorry, Jesus said, he is the father of lies. He doesn't have another character. That's what he is. So when he comes along and does a little whisper, shut up in Jesus' name. Can you see? Uh, because if you entertain that doubt, it sets in a hesitancy. There's a big thing going on in Charleston. There's always something going on there. And this is all about restaurants and stuff. So Sarah Lee, one of the girls in the church, she's in business, and she gets invited to these things because she's, well, I don't even go to it. But anyway, so last night they were supposed to go early evening to one of the, one of the restaurants they went the previous night as well. It's early evening things that they do. And then what they do is, out comes the old wine, you know. I said old because it is. Because the frotter it is, the happier they are. We like the new wine. I said, we like the new wine. Amen. We like the new wine. Come on, family. Don't go quiet on me now. Otherwise, I'll think there's some sipping saints sitting in this house. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Guess what happens? In the midst of the thing that they're doing there, and it's, very, it's by invitation only, and they all dress to their tees, you don't get invited unless you're at a certain standing in the city. People flew in from New York and different cities to, to be there. And Sarah Lee went because she was invited by the lady who's in the church who said, listen, I've got to go. It's part of my job and my business, um, so, so um, I've got to go. So you come as my number two. So she goes along. Watch God. Watch God. So there's a lady standing in her 50s in the corner to one side. And Sarah Lee feels the prompting of the Lord to go up. But before she gets to this lady, somebody else speaks to her, says, so, um, so what do you do? So, Je oh, so oh, Jesus, <laughs> praise the Lord, Jesus in there. So Sarah Lee says, oh, oh, well, I'm starting a church here. She says, that elephant grew so big in that room, it nearly pushed them all out. The woman went, really? Well, you know, I went to church many years ago down in the city. See? Confronting. Yes. Truth. But she didn't draw back and say, well, I was invited here by my friend. Look at the different conversation. Who was here because she's that girl over there and so on. And just walk your way and talk your way out of it. No, she confronted it. She says, I'm started a church. Then she makes a beeline for the lady standing in the corner who apparently is flown in from New York and gets flown around the world to these events. And I won't go into all the details. But she goes and speaks with this lady. And by the time she's finished, 
She's sharing the gospel with her. You see, the gospel is confronting. It doesn't matter which environment you are in. God is still God in that room. And don't draw back, because if you draw back, he can get you to draw back many more times. And so this lady eventually said to her, they stood and spoke to her for a while, and she eventually said, it's getting a little bit scary, this thing, because I keep bumping into people that are talking to me like this. So, you know, Sarah Lee said to her, ma'am, you can see God loves you. He's pursuing you. Now, this was one of the big wigs in the place. Don't draw back to perdition when the truth seems to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Because that means we're looking after our reputation not the truth of God's Word. And so what will happen is, if you do that in that environment, He will get you on the run in many more environments. But one time or another, you will have to face your mountain. Otherwise, you'll go round and round, round and round, round and round. And so we don't draw back to perdition. Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. So the Bible says in John 17, 17, Jesus praying, and he says, Sanctify them by your word, for your word is truth. Sanctify them by your word, for the word is truth. And so many times the enemy may even get you. Well, you, you respond to God, and I'm going to finish the story before midnight. And so when that happens, remember now he's in her face. Because he wants her to shut up. This is not the place to talk truth. So while the Who's who are sipping away at their wine and getting sloshed? The new wine's being spilt all over that lady. Come on. She says, yeah. Now, this is a lady who gets flown around the world, right? She doesn't actually drink. She's responsible for certain wine sales, promotions. And she gets flown around the world to Europe. She says, I'm very intrigued what, what happens in Europe. She says, because when I go to the vineyards in the places like the Spanish and that, they have a chapel. Because they say, all of them, they say, this is the harvest of God. They're not even embarrassed. They say, this harvest comes from God. So they have a little church close to their vineyards. Just interesting. Well, they tell us, history tells us some of the best oaks were priests. They were stuck in the monastery so tired of everything because it was the wrong way they should be doing it. They landed up brewing up a brew <laughs> <laughs> to make themselves happy because they'd given up on the new wine. Right? Where does it say you shall go hide in a building, in the Bible? Where does it say that? Are you against monasteries? No, not at all. But I'm not going there. Come on, family. Are you hearing what we're saying here tonight? Sanctify them by your word, for your word is truth. Let's go to Romans 6. Don't pull back. Don't pull back. Don't pull back. I'll go there, Lord. Romans 6, verse 12 to 14. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. 
protecting your reputation is the wrong thing to do. Because if you're dead, you don't have one. Don't quote, I'm dead in Christ, if you protect your reputation. I'm getting looks, strange looks. Verse 13, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin doesn't have dominion over you. Close your eyes and speak the truth if their face intimidates you. Just close your eyes. <laughs> Say, God loves you. Because that's what the devil does. He snarls and he makes you nervous. Come on. Come on. It's amazing to watch my daughter. She gets on the airplane with the biggest Bible, <laughs> sits there in the chair, <laughs> open goes her Bible, and everybody, you, you sense the air <laughs> out of the seats that are next to her. Why? Because it's confronting. What is she doing with the Bible here? This is an aeroplane. That's right. But they can read a porno mag, and that's okay. Come on when I'm preaching good. Come on. That's okay. But don't take a Bible out. Don't take a Bible out. She's really unashamedly bold. Goes to coffee shops. Out comes the Bible. Sometimes I think, well, could you have a smaller one? <laughs> the truth. I'll close with this. I've got one more word. The truth we use is directly proportional to the time we spend in the Word of God. And therefore, the level of freedom we walk in. Let me say that again. The truth we use, truth is for using, the truth we use is directly proportional to the degree of time that we spend meditating, reading, waiting on the Lord in the Word. And that time then equates to the level of freedom we walk in. Little time, little freedom. Come on. Little time, little freedom. Condemnation, it doesn't matter what it is. Sickness, anxiety, lack of vision, intimacy with God, etc., etc., so Jesus says, and I'll close, John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus relates how truth makes us free. He said it. Therefore, we have an assurance that if we declare that over our lives, we're hearing his voice because he said it. Speak that word to yourself. When he said that, he was looking at those who believed in him. And he said, you will be free. So if you walk in the truth, you will abandon the thoughts of helplessness. I don't know what I'm going to do. Ever said that? I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know how to get out of this mess. When you, con I'm talking to you as a believer, and if you're not a believer, if you connect with Jesus and give your life to Jesus, the same thing happens 
instantaneously. Hopelessness is no longer part of our conversation. Do you understand that? And so that's why God would bring this. Why? Because there truly is a devil who is stealing, killing, and destroying if we allow him. And always remember this. The moment you take a step back, he pushes harder. Um, he, uh, I've got him. Have you ever noticed? I said I'm closing. I've got a minute. I'm closing. <laughs> Have you noticed? The armaments of the Lord are always on the front, not on the back. Yeah. Why? Because people in the church shouldn't run. There's no need for the back to be covered because you're facing forward all the time. You are effectively always on the offensive. God bless you. Amen. Can we bless Pastor Craig again? It was very, very, very um, The load shedding was upgraded to stage four, so there will be load shedding at eight o'clock for the rest of the road. Um, <laughs> but praise God, and seriously, praise God for what he's done. Um, the, we'll just carry on. <laughs> So don't be in a rush to go home to your off-power house. Stay in. <laughs> yeah, stay here, have some fellowship, have some coffee. Just keep the fire warm, keep it going, yeah. Amen. All right. Um, a little bit of a quiz, right? What would you say is the most misquoted financial scripture in the Bible? Here we go. The love of money... Or let's say, rather this, this is how they say it. Money is the root of all evil. But that's not what it says. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. And so we see the tricky guy up to his tricks here, and we know that lie comes from the devil. And so one of his biggest ploys is to separate our money from our walk with God. He tells us that money is evil, um, don't go near it. Um, just, you know, learn a life of humility in your lack. And we talked about the monasteries, like you're not allowed to have a car, you must ride a bicycle, you must, you're not allowed to wear clothes with colors, you must wear the same cloak every day. Why? Because it's God's teaching you humility. Why? Because money is going to lead you into evil. And so that's nonsense, because the truth is that money in the hand of a believer is a, one of the most powerful expressions of his kingdom, where I can take money and I can use it to love. I can use it to bring the compassion of Jesus Christ. As you just giving examples of, of reaching out to people, I've found that when I give money first, it opens people up to the gospel. It's an amazing, it, it's like a vehicle that opens up a door to the expression of the gospel. And so money in the hand of a believer is the most powerful thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it talks about how when we, when we give to others, they go and they give glory to God in turn. And so it's, 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 it's used, God uses it for people to bring them close to Him. If you've ever been blessed with money, someone blesses you with something, what's your first reaction? Thank you, Jesus. It creates in someone it creates in the receiver an expression of praise. Why? Because you were obedient with your money. And that's what the devil's after. He knows you can change a life with money. You can build a house for someone. You can buy groceries for someone. You can bless somebody. You can take someone off the streets and just give them an education with money. But if you don't have it, you can't do it. You don't want it because it's evil, which is nonsense. So God says this to Abraham, you are blessed to be a blessing. So don't be scared of money. It's not going <laughs> to, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not going to lead you into sin. It's not going to lead you into temptation. God will give you the wisdom to steward finance as well, to be a blessing to others, and to steward his kingdom, to be an expression to others. Amen. Thank you for watching. Join us again next week to stay in touch with all that God is doing at Inside Church.